Okay, we're going to be looking at a series which Victory Point Games calls their Napoleon 20 series. And um, my introduction to the uh, games was with uh, Bordino. That was the first one I bought. And I've had the game for a couple of years, but never got around to playing it or punching it. I kind of um, made an advanced judgment on the series, thinking it was just nearly the Napoleon at Waterloo kind of redone and spiffed up a bit. But when I played my first Borodino game, I was pleasantly surprised. This is a very good series. And we're going to be looking at Waterloo in particular. I'll show you the board and counters, tell you a little bit about the game, how, how it plays, and then we'll see some of the other titles that I purchased in the series. All of the games come in small Ziploc packages. So that's literally the game right there. Although I've put them, uh, for my purposes, in uh, little plastic sleeves instead. And for storage, because I bought a few of the titles, I bought some of these uh, containers and I'm putting the rest of the series uh, in that. So um, they are very small, they're very portable. And I just timed myself in setting up the Waterloo scenario and uh, I set the whole game up in seven minutes and that's solitaire. So presumably if you're playing with an opponent you could probably cut that time in half and set these uh, games up in no time at all. Now, one of the nice features of the game series is that they share a common set of rules, and for the battles in particular, then you have these exclusive rules for each battle. And like I said, uh, this is the Waterloo scenario, which is the campaign. Now, the series prides itself, or takes its name from um, uh, the fact that there's about 20 counters or less in the game mix. Now, at first I thought, well, that's kind of absurd. How can you do Bordino or Waterloo with only 20 counters? But I was pleasantly surprised. Let's uh, take a look at the counters more closely. Now, the counters themselves are just absolutely beautiful. They're almost the most beautiful Napoleonic counters I've ever seen. These are the Prussian units there in black. And uh, you've got the combat number and the movement uh, factor number and uh, the core designation there. That, of course, is French cavalry, that's Prussians as we've, as we've noted, and um, here's some British units here. Very, very colorful. And on the flip side is generic flag for hidden movement. So counter-wise, this game is just, just gorgeous. They've done a beautiful job on the counters. Now for the purposes of this video, I've got the map oriented this way, um, but north is to right on this uh, orientation. So we have here, that's Quatre Bras, there is Waterloo and Mont Saint-Jean, down here is Wavre, and over here is the Ligny area. So we're used to seeing the uh, maps oriented north this way, and um, so those of you familiar with the campaign will uh, easily recognize the ground. So it is the campaign of Waterloo, not the battle, but um, they even have a Waterloo and Wave scenario for those of you who want to fight out just the battle around Mont Saint Jean. And like I said, they all have common rules and they're quite simple. It's the rigid zones of control concept which we first saw in uh, Napoleon at Waterloo. Now, the game does come with cards, but it's not a card driven game per se. Uh, that was another little comment I made when it first came out. I thought, my god, um, cards in a game so simple, that's absurd. But there isn't very many of them, and they modify the uh, turn, depending what event uh, occurs to each person. And um, I, I, I tell you, this game comes alive with these cards too. It's a very, very simple system, but I'm amazed how well it plays. So it's the Napoleon Waterloo system with the rigid zones of control and stuff. But the uh, designer, Joe Miranda, has added so much to it that um, this game just comes alive. Now, the other thing I'm very impressed with is, is the small size works for these uh, games. As you can see, I've set up the whole game here. There's the board. And let me refocus the camera here. As I'm saying, there's the board. There's your player aid mat. Uh, there's your train effects chart. And over here, here's your game turn and uh, weather track. So everything fits in a very, very compact area. Uh, that's what's amazing about this game. And like I said, I set it up in seven minutes. Well, how does it play? Well, I'm very glad to say that these games play great. They are a lot of fun. 
in the end, in all the games, you're trying to drive your opponent's morale level to zero. So that's the main objective of the game. The French here start at morale level eight, the Allied at seven. So when you get your uh, opponent to zero, you've broken them, and that's the end of the game. And most of the uh, games share that common denominator of victory conditions. Now, there are modifiers. There are uh, objective hexes in some of the games. But essentially, you're trying to drive um, your opponent's morale to nothing. Now, the combat results table, I thought, is pretty nifty. I was expecting an opponent Waterloo system. Very simple, lots of exchanges and defender eliminated. But that isn't what I got. Upon playing it, this game is really, really cool. Because, let's face it, you're playing these games at the core level, and you just can't have defender eliminated results on the core uh, level and expect the game to work. So what Joe's done is he's got a variety of results. You've got breaks, which causes the unit to leave the board and possibly be returned. You've got withdrawal uh, uh, results, which cause the defender to retreat, of course. You've got these routed uh, results, which are kind of neat. They work differently than the other games I've seen. When a unit is driven back, they roll a die, and depending on the die roll, that's how far back the unit goes. Therefore, if a cavalry, which moves three, rolls a three, he'll go back three hexes, but he's not really routed. To be considered routed, you have to exceed your movement allowance. So the infantry at two movement points has a greater chance of routing than the cavalry. And, of course, there's your invariable exchange result, which can result in uh, large casualties. And then there's this engaged result, which means the units just stay in their locked zones control. There's special rules for night, for engaging, disengaging, that kind of thing. Um, there's this hazardous retreat table, which all the other games I've played, the early ones, you, if, you, if you have to retreat into an enemy's zone control, you're usually destroyed. In this game, nope, he's improved on that. You've got this hazardous retreat table whereby if you have to retreat into an enemy zone of control, you roll on this table to see if you do break or whether you make it through. And then there's this controlled advance table. Remember all other games where you just advance after combat? Well, it's much more sophisticated. Uh, here you have to roll a die to see if you can uh, advance after combat. And um, there's your morale chart. All these modifiers affect the morale going up and down. Rallying, breaking a unit, retreating, that kind of thing and of course your rally table to uh, bring units back into the fold, so to speak. So there's a lot going on in these games. So don't be fooled by their size, as I was. They're small, but they are really good. Now for anyone that's studied the campaign, they know that the uh, weather played a factor in the campaign, and uh, a designer has some good uh, weather rules uh, in there. There's a chance that the weather will get better or worse. And as we all know, on June 17th, uh, the heavy downpour it certainly affected the campaign, as did the morning of the 18th, with the ground being very soft. So uh, the designer has got all that built in. And of course, your turn arrival with units arriving from off the board. So this is the Waterloo campaign, and uh, it's well done. Now, we're going to take a look at some of the boards to the other series I bought and uh, just tell you a little bit about those. Okay, now that's the Austerlitz game, and that took me about six minutes to set up. So, as I had mentioned, these are very uh, easy games to set up. Now, what I've uh, done here is that's the historical setup. There is an optional uh, setup because Austerlitz, as you know, is um, an unusual battle in that uh, Napoleon kind of tricked the Allies into attacking him, even though he was outnumbered. So uh, this game, and some of the others do, have uh, dummy counters, which are used to fool the enemy and conceal your positions and stuff. So that stuff is built into the um, system itself. Austerlitz, I like the map on this one too. It's got kind of a white, wintry feeling to it. Uh, the, bill, uh, the battle was fought in December. So it's got good period feel. So um, that's the Austerlitz game. And... Uh, Let's look at the setup for uh, Jena. Okay, and here's the setup for uh, the Battle of Jena, which also includes the uh, Battle of Auerstadt, which is fought over here. Um, as you can see, there isn't a lot of units in this particular game. Only three units French on the board, 
versus what? Three six Prussian units. Now this is an odd battle that uh, Napoleon found himself in. Napoleon believed he was facing the um, whole um, Prussian army. In fact, he was only facing a portion of it. It was actually Davout's corps that was facing the whole, uh, or a good portion of the Prussian army. So it's a, it's a twin, two battles on one board, very small uh, action, and uh, again, very well done. Again, you might want to use the dummy units in this game. I think uh, dummy units are going to be very important on this scale. There's your game turn record with units arriving at various times. So um, that's Yena 20. Uh, another great game in this series, and uh, let's take a look at um, another game in the series. Okay, and there's the setup for the Grand Battle version of the Battle of Borodino. Now, uh, this version of the game covers all three days, um, so the French units arrive here from the west, and the Russians are already set up in their dispositions. Of course, the Battle of Shevardino occurred around here. And there you have the Kolochka screen. Uh, screen. Um, you might notice some differences in the counters here. These are uh, they're dull counters. Some of the newer editions of the game have shiny counters, uh, belying the series' origins, because these have been produced over several years now, and the series is slowly evolving. I kind of like these dull counters. Shiny ones are nice too, but uh, dull ones are, are just fine. And of course you've got your tables, uh, for Davout's flank march and uh, Kutuzov's defense release, all kinds of special rules to cater the battle. Um, they got some neat little rules for the pontoon bridges here. They weren't actually constructed uh, across the river till I think the second day. They've got rules for that, and there's a an optional flank march uh, rule for Davu. So there's lots to explore in this little Borodino game too. So this uh, series was certainly evolving. Uh, now we're going to take a look at the last game in the series, at least the one I have, uh, Leipzig, which is a little bit different than the others. It's a larger game, and uh, we'll set it up and you'll see why. Okay, so here is the Leipzig map, and I've put the Waterloo map on top of it to show you the size. So you can see that the Leipzig edition is double the size of the others in the series. Um, I haven't set up the counters but uh, it's mainly to show you the size of the game. So the map is about double the size of the other ones in the series. Now keeping in spirit with the Napoleon 20 idea, they still have about 20 counters or so, but they've expanded the um, game a little bit and uh, you get uh, leadership uh, rules in here with leaders and uh, there's some optional rules for fatigue, things like that. The cards have also been upgraded in this series They've got nicer backings to them. There are more of them. And uh, this is a nice game um, in its own right. It almost uh, could be considered not part of the Napoleon 20 series. Um, it seems to be uh, a little bit more advanced than the other ones in the series. It still uses the standard rules, so you don't have to relearn anything. But um, that's Leipzig 20. So I'm going to end the video. I just wanted to introduce you to the series. I think uh, I'd like to do a video perhaps on each individual title. Um, I think they deserve it. This is a fine series. So I'll just mention the fact that there are other titles in the series that I've not shown. There's uh, Vittoria 20, uh, Dresden, Rose Bairn, uh, The Danube 20, uh, Fuentes de Noro, and I understand that GMT has it on their P500 list for a new volume. Uh, and there'll be four uh, titles in that including a new one uh, on the Battle of Eilau. So um, that's my introduction to this series, and um, kudos to Joe Miranda and Alan uh, Emmerich for creating such a, a fine series. I certainly will want to get more, and um, I think each of these uh, games deserves their own video. So in the future, I think I'd like to do a video on each one. So that's it for the um, introduction to the Napoleon 20 series by Victory Point Games. Thank you for watching.